Dude, we are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by David Clark, uh, Baron Clark of Windermere, who served as the Member of Parliament for Colne Valley from 1970 to 1974, the Member of Parliament for South Shields from 1979 to 2001, Shadow Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food from 1987 to 1992, Shadow Secretary of State for Defence from 1992 to 1997, and Minister for the Cabinet Office and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster from 1997 to 1998. He's also the author of a remarkable and fascinating book, Victor Grayson, The Man and the Mystery, the subject of today's podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Lord Clark. Hello. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is um, you first became interested in uh, Victor Grayson in the 1960s whilst uh, studying at the University of Manchester and going to help uh, with a by-election in Grayson's uh, former constituency. And you you, you talk about the, the book very eloquently about um, the sense of standing that Grayson still had uh, in, the, in the constituency despite having uh, disappeared uh, and not been the Member of Parliament for uh, many, many years years. Do you think that that is particularly unusual with the relationship between a member of parliament and their constituency? Yes, I do. And I was really struck that when I was canvassing as a very uh, young man, having just gone to Manchester University as a mature student, I was um, knocked on doors. And increasingly, a number of people said, oh, well, whoever gets elected won't be anywhere near as good as Victor Grayson. So I began to think, well, who is this Victor Grayson? I hadn't heard of it. Mm. So I went back to Manchester and um, dug a little bit and went back to Cone Valley again. And I was getting the same message. And it really was, I'd done a lot of canvassing, although I was very young at that time. Um, and this just struck me that this was unusual. And I must find a bit more out about the man. And then, of course, by a, a quirk of fate, I ended up being the candidate, Labour candidate for Cone Valley, and eventually, the MP for Cone Valley. So I was able to um, explore my interest. And what I found fascinating, I was managed to record a number of interviews with individuals who had actually seen Grayson, met Grayson, mm. actually been to his meetings, and also been active in the Labour Party in his later years in the constituency. So this gave me an understanding of the man, which was, well, quite frankly, is now unique. Hmm. And um, one of the things that I, I think is, is interesting and you um, emphasise in the book, and if, if you read anything about Grayson, that is, is, is clearly um, an important part of his appeal, was his ability to be uh, an incredible orator, someone who could really capture um, an audience in the palm of his hand. Do you think that that was something that was particularly important during the early 20th century in, in terms of members of parliament uh, getting elected? Because, of course, this is a time when, um, you know, the main means of uh, media uh, communication is through the written word is through newspapers and we don't have anything uh, like we have today in terms of uh, television or, or social media or anything like that. Do you, do you think it was particularly important for him that he was able to stand out so much through his, uh, his great speech-making abilities? Yes, this was the key. And he really was the man of the moment at the right place in 1906, 1907, running up to the by-election in Cone Valley. Cone Valley, an unusual constituency sandwiched in the high Pennines and their valleys um, between Manchester, Huddersfield and Wakefield. And um, it really was composed of many 
small industrial villages. The villages which depended on the textile industry, uh, mainly wool in the east, mainly cotton in the west, but not uniquely so. And each of these villages were, were quite small, but they were self-contained. And they also were, and it was an area of, I described it of chapels and chimneys. And that's what it was. There was a deeply held religious um, belief in the valley. And in comes Victor Grayson, who'd been training to become a Unitarian minister. And he knew his Christianity, and he used his Christianity in these years as part of his oratory. It was part of his mix. Mm. And whilst he was training at Manchester University to become a Unitarian minister, he got mixed up in the socialist movement, and Cone Valley was only 12 miles at the western end from Manchester University. You could easily get there by train, and he became a regular visitor. He really was the ideal candidate for that constituency at that moment of time. And he delivered the goods for socialism at that particular time. Hmm. And you, you mentioned uh, Grayson's uh, faith there, and particularly early on in his life and in his political life, it seems to be something that um, was important to him and useful to him uh, in, in terms of grounding uh, his ability to um, make speeches and uh, his his ability to converse with people. To what extent do you think that the um, combination of Christianity and socialism in the early days of the, the Labour Party from the 1890s into the, the 1900s was important in um, convincing people to support the Labour Party instead of the uh, Liberal Party? Do you think it was that sort of support and mixed um, linkage to the non-conformist tradition that really helped uh, the Labour Party during that period, particularly in uh, Yorkshire and Lancashire? Yes, there, there was this strong non-conformist element, and it was really very important. But equally, the Church of England in these areas, I mean, these were small villages, mm. The Church of England was composed not of posh people, not of upper middle class people, because there weren't many upper middle class people. It was composed itself of working people. And therefore, the Church of England was important. And one of the slogans, of course, um, that Victor Grayson used was uh, socialism, God's gospel for today. And in the election campaign, he had occasions where he had, um, I think it was up to 40 ministers of religion uh, getting together and giving their support to him. Mm. He pressed the right buttons. Um, and of course, it was genuine in those early days. Um, coming from where he did in Liverpool, from a very poor working class background, he actually felt that that wasn't a fair society. His socialism was, was ethical as well. And it was that ethical socialism that appealed to many working class people in the industrial areas of, the, of Lancashire, Yorkshire in particular, and elsewhere. Mm. Um, now, one of the things that you mentioned um, before uh, Victor Grayson uh, entered the valleys that in, in 19... Uh, oh, 05, he, he was travelling around uh, Lancashire with the, the Clarion van. And of course, the, the, the Clarion van and the um, ILP van were important means of um, communication uh, for the, you know, the socialist um, groups at the time in order to get their message out. I mean, how comparable do you think the activities of uh, the Clarion van are to uh, modern day uh, electioneering? Or, or, or do you think that they are uh, totally of, of another world and, and very much removed from any comparison with um, modern uh, canvassing and electioneering? Well, today, of course, all the political parties are striving to find 
better ways to communicate with the electorate. And I think in recent years, and at this moment in time, social media is one of the key new ways forward. Mm. And of course, you might actually think of the Clarion Van movement, where people went round with the caravans being pulled by horses. Oh, this is before motor cars. And um, they spoke. And of course, the caravans themselves were a great... You'd go into a small village or an area, and you'd um, tie up the horse, and you'd start speaking from the front of the caravan. And it was a very personal way to actually take your message to people. And it was very effective. But I think it was, in a sense, the equivalent of the social media of today. But of course, even today, any MP or candidate worth his salt or her salt needs to be out there being seen mm. in constituencies. So again, it forms a, um, a, a relationship and people actually talk about, oh, I was in so-and-so before. And I actually saw, I saw the, the Labour MP or I saw the Labour candidate or something like that. Very, very important even today. But we shouldn't, I don't think, um, compare, <laughs> I know you're not, the Clarion Van movement, effective as it was. And of course, in those days, the Clarion Van was connected to the Clarion newspaper, mm. edited by Robert Blatchford, who was a very close friend, almost a father figure for Grayson and guided Grayson through those early years until they, they rather fell out. But the, the truth was the Clary movement was very important and it gave Grayson an opportunity to switch from his ethical, religious stroke socialism to a more formal and organized sense of socialism, mm -hmm. although he never actually became a, 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 what you might call a doctrinal socialist in mm -hmm. many ways. Mm -hmm. um, it, turning to the by-election now, um, it, it was an extraordinary uh, event and, and it was something that really did um, shock British politics and um, shock um, the, the, the world in a way, um, politically. Um, just thinking about uh, Grayson's candidature, he originally had tried to be uh, the Labour candidate, but wasn't selected as uh, the Labour candidate. He instead stood as uh, an independent uh, socialist uh, candidate. How important do you think it was in, in terms of the recognition of the by-election that he didn't uh, win the seat under uh, the, the Labour standard as such? Well, it, it, Cone Valley was unusual, let me put it that way. <laughs> and of course, the trade union um, were very important in the emerging new Labour Party because it was a newly formed Labour Party at mm. this time. And um, the selection process was actually through trade unions plus individual members of the Labour Party, although they didn't come strong until after the First World War. So when Grayson tried to get selected and the local people in Cone Valley, because Cone Valley was the first Labour parliamentary constituency party in the whole country in 1891. It predated the National Labour Party or even the National ILP. So, and the people of Cone Valley, the, the Labour activists, had heard Grayson, they liked Grayson, and they wanted him as their candidate. And they did everything they could, and Victor Grayson did as well, to try and get the nomination. But at the end of the day, the way they did it was out of order with the National Labour Party rules. So he couldn't become the Labour candidate. Now, did it affect the election? I think in 1907, Grayson would have been elected, um, whether he'd stood as the official Labour candidate or 
as he did the Labour and Socialist candidate. He still kept the name Labour in his title in 1907. So he had the best of both worlds. And um, as I say, he really did captivate the local people in a way which I've never experienced before. And I must have canvassed in literally hundreds of constituencies over the past 60 years. Mm. Um, w- one of the things that I think is, is interesting in reading the book, and um, I, I think people will find interesting in looking back on the early history of the Labour Party, is to see a certain um, uh, tension between uh, the uh, element, early elements of the Labour Party, the ILP, and certain of um, the trade unions. It wasn't a, a necessarily a, a harmonious uh, evolution. There was some sort of, uh, at, at times, rather uh, bitter disagreements. And, of course, a lot of um, trade union members and trade unions uh, still at this point were supporting uh, the Liberal Party. Do you think that that's something that has been uh, overlooked when discussing the early history of the Labour Party, that there is perhaps a, a, an assessment and an impression that um, the Labour Party and the trade unions were, um, you know, the completely in step in, in, in the early period and there wasn't any uh, real uh, disagreement? And do you think that this is something that should be explored more, the sort of uh, certain, at uh, particular points, combativeness between the trade union movement and the early Labour Party? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a very difficult relationship because what was happening was the trade unions were providing the bulk of the money, the overwhelming bulk of the money, about 10 to 1, Whereas the ILP, the Independent Labour Party, was getting the can- Labour candidates, which were paid for by the trade unions. And um, it meant it was a lopsided sort of party. Now, the party realised that and didn't actually put it right until 1918, mm. when there was individual membership of the party. So you could become an individual member of the Labour Party after 1918, whereas before then, you could only be a member of either a trade union or one of the few socialist uh, parties, such as the Independent Labour Party. Very complicated situation, a lot of tension, a lot of disagreement, and it was probably the result of the war when things, opinion changed and opinion split all parties, that things um, became clearer and the Labour Party realised what it had to do and did do it. Mm. I, just um, looking at w- one of the um, slogans that was used ag- against um, Grayson that you mention in the book, uh, why does Grayson fight as a socialist? Because he cannot fight as a trade unionist. Vote for Bright. Do, do, do you think that the sort of like the um, separation in a way, as, as you mentioned there, between um, the, the, the socialist um, movements and the trade union is, is the seem, uh, seeming uh, lacking of uh, alignment uh, properly and, and until after the war was one of the reasons that the Labour Party uh, did take uh, quite a, a long time from its conception to um, entering uh, government as a, as a as a national force. Do you think if there had been a bit more of a, an agreement earlier on, then Labour might not have had to have waited until the, the 1920s to properly uh, enter government? Yeah, there's something in that, of course, but we've also got to think of and realise that the uh, 40% of adult men did not have a vote, and of course, mm. no women. So only the slightly better off working man had the vote. You had to either be a house owner or pay a rent of a certain level in order to get the vote. That was right up to 1918. And it was the change of the voting system and the widening of the franchise and the introduction of the vote for women that really gave a fillet for the Labour Party. So I think that was the key reason why Labour had such difficulty in breaking through. 
And of course, this caused problems in the small industrial villages because um, you know people usually rented their houses and rents were very low. You just drive through some of these little villages today and you'll see several roads. I don't want to exaggerate the numbers because mm. the population of these villages wasn't big, set of these villages. And the result was a large number of those families living in those um, houses in 1907 did not actually have the vote. And this made it very difficult for the Liberals at the end of the day, because these 40% of the, um, the, of the voters, men, all the women, really felt aggrieved that, min, that Liberal mill owners often had two votes. They had mm. a vote in Cone Valley, in our case, and also a vote in Huddersfield or Oldham. I mean, it really wasn't a level playing field, and that was a great difficulty the Labour Party had to overcome. Mm. I'd, I'd like to turn now to um, at Grayson's parliamentary uh, career, because as a member of parliament, he was perhaps um, not the uh, most active of MPs uh, within the House of Commons. Do you think that that was um, purely a result of um, the drinking problem which he had developed over that period? Or do you think it was simply that um, he was perhaps more at home making speeches uh, to, to, to people and uh, to crowds than necessarily uh, proposing or debating legislation within the chamber? Well, I think um, it's a mixture of things. Mm. But the basic point about Grayson is he was never a man for detail. He didn't like doing committee work, much preferred speaking on the floor of the House. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't actually work with uh, colleagues or even local party people to work through things. He much preferred to do what he did best, actually. Mm -hmm. and that was to speak to people from a platform. And that he realised his great strength and he played to it. But, I mean, it cost him dear. And um, I once described him as Labour's lost leader. And I think probably he could have been Labour's leader. Um, not at this time, mm. but he could have been a lab Labour's leader after the First World War. If he'd actually stuck in there, worked with the Parliamentary Labour Party, because the First World War showed the Labour Party completely split. Mm. Grayson and Blatchford of the Clarion movement were very much in favour of promoting the war. I mean, the things Grayson said about the Germans, it is quite horrible, really. Mm. But he said them. And actually, in the end, as you know, went to Australia and New Zealand and a recruiting sergeant for the British forces and eventually joined up and, as we know, was wounded and invalided out. Mm. Um, so I think he could have been a, a leader of the Labour Party, but he just couldn't bear working, doing the detailed work to bring that about. And one other thing, at this time, he also may have saved the Labour Party in, in a sense, because there was a move to break away from the Labour Party by mm -hmm. many individual socialists, and then um, to form an independent socialist party and Grayson was part of that but he got outmaneuvered because he didn't go to enough of the committee meetings and in the end um, he wasn't part of the movement that went ahead really and the movement for an independent socialist party failed because partly partly because of Grayson um, not really being as assiduous as he should have been so I think a lot of it was Grayson's character. Mm. I mentioned um, the First World War and um, his work as a, a recruiting sergeant and, and service in the, um, the New Zealand Army. Do you think that the um, split, as you mentioned, over the, uh, the, the First World War was a real turning point for the Labour Party in terms of the um, direction that it was uh, 
you know, going to go in. Do you think that the the the, the war presented a sort of like a, a, a lightning uh, rod moment where had Labour perhaps been more united uh, one way or the other, whether in support of the war or in uh, complete opposition uh, to it, that the Labour Party may not have been able to enter government in the 1920s? I think it was important Mm. because a number of Labour uh, parliamentarians actually played a part in the government under Lloyd George and they gained respectability. And I think it allowed them, you look at their votes um, in 1918 general election with the following election four or five years later. And um, they, I think, doubled their votes, so to speak. They suddenly became, people realised that it was possible for the Labour Party to govern the country. And of course, in 1923, in a very minority position, uh, they did form a government and they struggled on for a few months. And it failed in the end. But that didn't matter because it got through to the British people that the Labour Party could govern and their votes increased from then onwards, right through to 19, apart from 1931, right through to 1945, where Clement Attlee managed to lead a huge majority for the Labour Party that rebuilt Britain after the Second World War. They represented, they caught the mood of the time and um, they were reward, rewarded for doing so. Mm. I'd, I'd line, like now to um, turn to, uh, of course, uh, one of the things that has interested people for so long about Victor Grayson, which is his uh, disappearance. Now, I, I, I'm not going to comment on the... Um, theories that you mention in the book simply because you know obviously I would encourage everyone to go out and buy the book because I think it's a fantastic um, read Uh, but the one thing that I would like to ask you about is do you think that had Grayson not disappeared uh, not suddenly vanished that he would have had a, a significant role to play in the Labour Party of the 1920s 1930s or do you think that by the time uh, that he disappeared uh, in 1920, that there was no real future for him uh, in the Labour Party? Well, he he got himself into a very difficult position by 1920. No doubt about that. Um, he'd, um, he had gained respect from joining up and having the courage of his convictions. No doubt about that. People respected him for that. But um, he had identified himself with the Conservatives, especially in this period, and I think had lost a lot of support from those of socialist inclination. It's very difficult, really, to put your finger on this. And then, as you kind of mentioned earlier, he actually did love a good life. Mm. He found it very satisfying and thoroughly enjoyed it. And of course he had really from 1907 onwards, increasingly relied on whiskey, not so much alcohol. I mean, people I've spoken to have served with him, a New Zealander I spoke to um, who'd served with him in the New Zealand forces said, you could go out drinking with them, with Victor. He'd drink wine all night and Mm. not be drunk. But if he started on whiskey, he was gone. And that really was the basic problem, I think. he became become reliant on whiskey. And the greater his disappointment in his political progress, I think, made him turn increasingly to whiskey. And we've got uh, example of example. We're very keen supporters of him, like Lord Fenebrockway, one example of whom I interviewed. And he said, I was such a fan of Grayson. Then I went to meet him with some other socialists in the House of Commons um, in about 1989. And we met him at 11 o'clock in the morning. And he was clearly drunk by that time. Mm -hmm. And I said, we we, we were, uh, we didn't drink. And we just couldn't believe it. And our support for Grayson began to dissipate from that time. 
drink was one of, was the major problem, I think, for Grayson by 1920. Mm. Um, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. It's been wonderful uh, to be able to talk to you, uh, Lord Clark, and I have one a final question. Um, now, of course, Victor Grayson's um, disappearance means that his fate is uh, officially uh, unknown, though, of course, there are all sorts of competing theories as to um, what happened to him. But if by some uh, strange uh, quirk of fate, somehow um, you were able to, to meet Victor Grayson, what do you think you would say to him if you were ever uh, able to meet him through some sort of a quirk of time or something like that? That's a difficult one. Mind you, I did. I haven't done the next best thing. I became very friendly and a close friend of his daughter, mm. Elaine, and her husband, Raymond. And I spent many hours discussing uh, her father and what might have happened, much as, such as we've talked today. And I also spoke to Hilda Porter, who was his landlady, and she was the last person on the uh, September the 28th, 1920, who saw Grayson. She saw him leave uh, his accommodation with, with two men and provide us with clues. But what would I say to, um, to Victor? Well, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. We, I'm certain I'd tell him the stories of how I became interested in him, in him, especially in Cone Valley, mm -hmm. because Cone Valley is an exceptional constituency, a unique constituency. And the feeling I had in the 1960s and 70s, I'm sure he would have identified me. So I'm sure we would have had personal interests and personal things to talk about then, the wonderful people there. But now, what would I say on politics? Because in a sense, I, may, I think in some ways, I'm the opposite of Grayson. Mm -hmm. I found it not difficult to concentrate on details, to serve on committees, to get into a Labour cabinet and to actually identify what I was going to do, freedom of information and actually modernizing the machinery of government. That's all I did mm. in the cabinet. But I achieved something, especially with the freedom of information, mm. which will last for decades. So I'm so different from Victor. So I think we might have debated that. <laughs> and equally, I would have admitted, look, I'm not in the same league as you when it comes to oratory. When you were on the public platform, you could have people eating out of your hands, and you did so across the country and across the world. I couldn't even compete with him, but I'd <laughs> like to talk to him about him and see what he thought about modern politics as well. Mm, I think that that would have been a, a truly fascinating conversation. Thank you uh, for coming on to the, the podcast, Lord Clark. Um, if people uh, want to purchase the book, um, where do you think uh, they should go to to purchase it? Yeah, I'm just laughing here. Um, I think the best thing is to go onto the internet and try and get it that way. Um, it should be available. It should be available. And I'm working hard to, to get it. But I think the company that pr uh, produced the book mm -hmm. has just this last week possibly gone into voluntary liquidation. Oh. So um, quartet books. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to make sure that the books remain available. So we'll have to see what we do because um, I, I <laughs> sounds odd to say this, but I reread it, the book, and it's very kind what you said, how enjoyable you found the book. I don't know about enjoyable, but what I will say is, factually, it provides all the information that people write about today. It's all there in the book. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you very much again for coming on the podcast, Lord Clark, and hopefully you will be able to ensure that the the book is widely available so that uh, anyone who wishes to purchase a copy will be able to do so. Yes, we will. Thanks very much, Will. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.